hopefully you should be able to see this now is that uh yeah yeah yep. okay um I shouldn't need to share computer sound, but just in case we'll have that up. Okay, I'm right. So motorcycling across Uzbekistan, following the Silk Road. Um, yes, yeah, so I've taken two routes across the Silk Road and we'll start talking about those in just a minute. So quite often when I do talks like this, I think most people's questions are, how on earth did you start by becoming, how do you become a world motorbike traveler? Well, I've always been a traveller. My dad was in the army, so I grew up always moving. And it just is nat it feels natural to me. So as an adult, I've continued to do a lot of travel with a backpack um, and then more recently with a motorbike. And in fact, in my motorbike travels, here's a map of all the routes. Well, in fact, some of the routes, in fact, they're not all on there, but it was getting a bit mess messy. But um, if you take a look at that map down there, these are some of the routes I've taken on my many motorbike travels. And you can see I've covered every continent. Um, I've crossed some of them two or three times and uh, I still travel now. And so how did I start? Well, as I said, I'd done a lot of backpacking and then um, quite a few years ago now, actually 20 years ago now, I was talking with a friend and we decided we wanted to go and travel in India and in fact we would travel to India and let's go by motorbike we said. Now I didn't have a motorbike and neither did my friend Becky and in fact we didn't have licenses to ride, we didn't know how to ride so we went out, we did five day crash course, learned how to ride motorbikes, got licenses and went out and bought a second hand BMW. Now I apologise profusely for the blurriness of this photo. And if I'd have realised that all these years later, there'd be the media interest that there has been in my journey, I'd have made sure there was a proper photographer there that day. Uh, my sister, Sam, took this picture of Becky and myself. I'm the one with no hair. I sold my hair the day before we left. It was really long at that point, um, down to my waist. And I sold it all to a wig maker to buy some tools and some other bits of equipment for my bike trip. Um, we were very much on a budget and I just felt that was one way I could contribute and I wanted to travel with short hair anyway. So there's Becky on the front of the bike and myself on the back and we took off and we rode to India. We had a great time on the way, as you can see. Um, this was in Pakistan. I, our riding skills did improve. At first we were falling over all the time or dropping the bike as bikers say. We made so many friends along the way and the sights we saw were quite incredible really. And I realized that traveling on two wheels can be the best way to see the world. The motorbike itself is an instant icebreaker. And also on two wheels, you can go absolutely anywhere. We can follow footpaths, we wild camp everywhere. And so I would just go, we'd head off into the mountains and just put the tent up and camp out in the mountains and then go and ride through the towns, the plains, the deserts and everything during the day. We did also stay in hotels at times. And we realized as well, particularly as being two women on a motorbike, that we were the center of attention everywhere. And there was a real focus on us. And in fact, if you look at this picture carefully, there we are, there's me. You can see my hair had started to grow by this point. Um, and everyone's staring this way because actually Becky's on this side with the camera and with the motorbike. And it was actually the motorbike people were more interested in rather than ourselves. So the focus is on the motorbike and they're all stood there staring while she clicks the photo. And as you can see, there are no women present in this picture apart from myself. Now, why did I end up in Africa? Well, having made it to India, we looked at each other and said, this has been such fun, I don't want to stop. Well, neither do I. Well, let's carry on. We've still got some money and we managed to make it from India on through Southeast Asia to Australia. We stopped and worked there. And then with the money we'd saved in Australia, we rode home through Africa, finally making it back to England two and a half years after we'd set off. <laughs> My mum was a bit surprised. I had said to her when I first set off, I said, oh, we're going to India, we'll be about eight or nine months. 
And so that was my travel bug, well and truly bitten. Yeah, I'll, I'll sit there. Oh. There's some sound going on there. Okay. Um, so travel bug and I was well and truly bitten to do motorbike travels. I went on to do lots more travels in Africa. So from the heat of Africa to the snows of the Himalayas and riding over some of the highest peaks in the world. But how did I end up riding to Uzbekistan? Well, in between some of my various journeys, I suddenly had a yearning to go to Mongolia. And I thought, okay then, right, I want to go to Mongolia. I'll ride there, which is what I tend to do everywhere. Um, you can see the motorbike in the picture here. And I should say a bit here, it's a BMW R80 GS, a 1992 model. It's, and so when I say R80, it's 800 CC and it weighs quarter of a ton. So it's quite big and heavy. And actually for a first motorbike, completely impractical, um, very tall, bike as well I'm on tiptoes to reach the ground but it was perfect to carry two people and all their travel gear and camping gear and spare parts and cooking gear all of that sort of stuff to carry us all the way and I've stuck with the same bike ever since so to go to Mongolia I had a look at the map of the world and I realized the more interesting route to go will be through what we call the stands or Central Asia and it more or less follows the Silk Route. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> every time I wash my hands, I take it off. Okay. Have you ever been to Mongolia? No. Fascinating. Thing. Excuse me, could you please switch off your mics? Because oh. we can <laughs> hear your conversation, you interrupting with the speaker. I thought that it was uh, already. Sorry. Thank you. That, that's all right. Okay, thank you. And so you can see this was a, a rough route for that first journey to get to Central Asia and then to continue on to Mongolia. And I had company on this trip as well. So this is my mum's friend, Anne. And Anne had said, Tiffany, I want some adventure in my life. And can I come on one of your trips? And I said, well, I'm heading off to Mongolia in a few months time. And she said, that sounds wonderful. I'll come with you. She, however, didn't have as much time as I did. So we made a plan that I would set off on the bike and six weeks later, she would meet me in Tashkent. So I had a bit of a timetable to reach Uzbekistan and get to Tashkent, but I did make it because this was a picture of Anne with me there. And this talk has actually got photos from two trips because I enjoyed that journey so much that I repeated it a couple of years later with a few other people. So what I should say is this initial trip was in 2009 and the other trip was in 2011. And the reason I went back a few years later was by this point, I'd built up a bit of a reputation as a motorbike traveler and I was actually headhunted to go and be a motorbike guide. So one of my work roles these days is as an international motorcycle tour guide, which means I get given a big motorbike. And this is me on the far left here. I get given a big motorbike, a group of tourists, all with their own motorbikes, and I'm directed to lead them across various parts of the world. So this particular journey was from the UK to Beijing via Everest Base Camp. And in fact, that's Mount Everest that you can see in the background. We're on our way up to Base Camp at this point on the Tibetan side. And our route to Tibet took us through Uzbekistan. So there's photos from both journeys. And this was the route I took with my group when we went. So the sort of slightly more Southern route down through Turkey, and then skirting the Caspian Sea through Iran into Turkmenistan and up into Uzbekistan, um, down Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and on towards Beijing via Tibet. And it's a long way to Uzbekistan, and there are a lot of countries to go through and some incredible places to see and some of the experiences, like riding past the mosques in Istanbul, and going through Iran, I've crossed Iran a couple of times now, and each time I've dressed in a shador, so I'm suitably attired for the country. And I do look rather like a nun on the run as I ride through Iran with my shador flying back like that. 
this was um, some photos that I took while off road and I had to prop my camera on top of my helmet on the ground, which is why I'm not wearing my helmet in this picture. It was purely to take the photo. But usually I'm wearing all that with my motorbike helmet on top. And generally I wear a white helmet because it reflects the heat. I realized very quickly that black clothing will draw in the heat and I'd get too hot. So generally I wear a white helmet and particularly for the desert countries of Central Asia. And some of the other sites to see along the way. So these are the flaming gas craters of Darvaza, which I'm sure some of you will have visited. They are about a day's ride from the Uzbek border and they are phenomenal, deep in the desert of Turkmenistan. And you can see the size of them here because in the background, there's people standing around the edge of the craters well, sorry, the crater, it's one big crater. And this is a gas that was mined by the Russians and they, they decided they'd got all the gas out and they said, well, we'll burn off the last remnants of the gas. They set fire to it and they went off back to Russia and all this time later, it's still burning. It's been burning for 60 years now. So those were some of the amazing sights to see and the route I absolutely didn't want to take is one that's going to show up. So we're looking at this map here of Central Asia and the one of the most common routes to come in from the west is through Azerbaijan to the capital of Baku and to take a ferry across. The ferries across the Caspian Sea are also known as the stinky boats. They are bad, really bad. Um, they take a long time, there's no schedule, and there's no guarantee you're going to get to your port of destination. However, needs must, and I was due to take the short ferry from Baku across to Turkmenistan and then ride up to Uzbekistan. However, Turkmenistan decided they didn't want me in their country and turned me down for my visa, so I had to change my plans. And I had to get a different stinky boat, the much longer ferry that goes up to Aktau in Kazakhstan. And so I set off across it to take that boat across there, knowing full well what lay ahead of me. That area there. Now, I don't know if any of you have been up there, but that's the Kizilkum Desert on the border between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And it's not a great place to travel if you're on a motorbike and you really don't want to go that route. So I was quite dismayed really. I was on my own in Azerbaijan. I had a timetable that I had to get to Tashkent by and I've now found out I've got a longer route to go on and I've got a desert with no road to cross. However, needs must and I pushed on and the desert can look like this and it's beautiful but on a motorbike it's more like this. The heavy bike and I've already said it weighs quarter of a ton digs down in the soft sand and it's a massive struggle at times to ride through. It also uses a lot of fuel and in the desert there are no settlements, there are no petrol stations, so where am I going to get this fuel from? These were all thoughts going through my head as I travelled on the stinky boat across Caspian Sea. I was in luck because on that same boat there was one other European and this was Leon, an Austrian guy in his rather unusual looking four by four van. And he was traveling across the world to India. And Leon and I made friends and he was heading down to Uzbekistan and we decided to team up to cross the desert. From my point of view, it was great. I could put my bags on his van and also he could carry extra fuel for me. As you can see, he's got some fuel containers here. So he was happy to carry the extra fuel. And from his point of view, he was quite a nervous traveler. This was his first ever long distance trip. So he was reassured by the fact that here's someone on a motorbike who's got lots of travel experience. And if anything did happen to him and he had a breakdown in the desert, then I'd be available to go and raise the alarm. So we traveled together as a team, which was perfect as far as I was concerned. He could take photos of me doing dramatic riding shots through the desert. And there was company at night as well when I was camping out in the wild. Now, generally, I will camp anywhere where there's no other accommodation. 
quite often it looks like this. So just my tent with the motorbike, that's when Anne had joined me. So you can see Anne in that picture. But then with Leon alongside, I also had the luxury of a fridge in his van, which a fridge is pretty important when you're in the hot desert. And we would share our food, cook food. And there was that luxury of a table and, even, and he carried a spare chair. So a table and chairs to sit at in the evenings. He's also able to take the photos when I inevitably somehow dropped the motorbike. I'm still not sure what caused me to fall off here, but as you can see, I'm fine. And the nice thing about having someone with me is I could get them to help me pick up the motorbike. And he was also there when we came across some of the wildlife, such as the camels. And there's a lot of wild horses as well in that part of the world. However, it turns out that he's not very good at mechanics. And so I was still having to do my roadside repairs myself. This is quite a common part of life for me on a motorbike that's over 20 years old now, having to do various repairs and maintenance jobs by the side of the road, wherever I happen to be. I quite often get a bigger crowd of people watching when I'm doing this type of thing than when I'm just riding. On the back of my motorbike there as well, you can see there's a map of the world and that shows my route. So I use that as a conversation piece when I'm traveling and also in many countries to give people a sense of place of where their country lies in the world. So we're in the Kazilkum desert. It's very hot. The riding is quite brutally hard at times and I get exhausted. I remember at one point we came upon on a bit of shade by this rocky overhang. And I said to him, I've just got to stop for a while. And I lay down and promptly fell fast asleep. I might look like I'm sucking my thumb, but I'm quite sure I wasn't. Um, apparently I was just flat out fast asleep for half an hour or so, and then woke up refreshed and carried on riding. It is hard work. The desert cleared and the roads got better. Still not amazing by our standards. And of course, there's various tourists, sorry, various pedestrians always trying to cross the road. And I think for us in the UK, we'd regard this as a building site rather than a road. But even those roads improved and suddenly there was some tarmac as well. Hurrah, we'd made it out of the sand. And in fact, I'd made it to the edge of Kiva. I'm sure some of you have been to Kiva with its amazing architecture there. So I got to the edge of Kiva and this is when I was riding with my group and I went off for a bit of sightseeing around the town. Having a look at some of these ancient things as well. Now I was told these were used at one point for storing um, food to keep it cool and also for storing water and I couldn't help jumping in for just to see what it was like inside it. Some of the buildings I came across were absolutely amazing. I haven't seen architecture like this since Turkey. And of course, the children are drawn to the motorbike. This little boy borrowed his brother's bicycle to come and show me that he also had something with two wheels. And of course, when one child arrived, soon there's plenty more and they were all queuing up to sit on the motorbike, have their photo taken and to try and ask me questions about the motorbike as well. I'd also paused here because I was quite interested in that map behind me. It shows the Silk Road. And it was one of the few signs as well I saw that were in English then. And I've pointed out to where I was next going to. So there we are, Bukhara is gonna be my next destination. However, the map that I managed to draw on my GPS was very different from the one on the wall. As you can see, I don't know if you're all familiar with GPS, I ended up going round and round in circles, trying to find my hotel in Bukhara. I did make it there. And I also made it to the Kalyan Tower, some one of the most stunning sites on this trip. And whilst I'm doing my tourist sightseeing, others are doing their own sightseeing and asking to pose for photos with the motorbike. It's really good, this, um, this progress of people having camera phones. I'm perfectly happy having my photo taken for so many years now as a tourist, 
I've been the one with the power and the camera. But these days, so many people have a camera on their phone that they're able to sort of ask me for photos as well. And I feel it's one of the things I can do as a thank you to the peoples in the countries I'm traveling. And then on a very different level were these ladies. They were inside what I thought of as a bus shelter beside the road. And they had waved to me and flagged me down as I came past. And as I usually do, I stopped to have a chat and find out a bit more about them. And they very quickly explained what they were doing there. They're actually selling turkeys. So in the shade of the bus shelter, they had all their turkeys with their feet trussed up so they couldn't escape and with their dog there as well, keeping guard, although it doesn't look very ferocious. And they were selling turkeys to the passing cars, trucks, and also they wanted to sell me one. I told them, listen, I'm on a motorbike. I don't have space for a turkey. And they promptly showed me how they would attach two live turkeys to the back seat of my motorbike. I did feel a bit trapped, but I said, no, no, I absolutely cannot take turkeys with me. It would have been probably worth it though for the entertainment value when I did catch up with my group. This was one of the days when I was tour guiding. I was very interested in the different people that I met on the way through Uzbekistan. Um, no doubt you'll be, you could probably identify the rough area where these women came from by their clothing and the style of headdress. And arriving in Samarkand, I wanted to go for the classic photos and some of them are easier to get than others. And obviously the Registan stands out as one of the must see places in the world. And I wanted to get some photos that were a bit different and I found out one way of doing it. How to get this photo with no tourists and with the motorbikes right in front of some of the most ornate tile work in the world. We'd pulled up and I'd asked, this was the day before I pulled up and I talked to some people there and I found out the way to do it. And that's to get up at 5 a.m. and go down to the Registan and talk to the guards and to give them some money. I think it was five or $10. And they would give us access to that part of the buildings. I talked to my tour group about it and I said, right, if you want the best photos of your motorbike here in this incredible place. You need to get up at 5 a.m. and come down with $10 to the Registan with me and we'll be able to take the motorbikes in. In the end, only one of my group of 12 wanted to, I was able to get up at 5 a.m. I think that was their biggest struggle, the getting up. They were suffering with the heat, um, more so than me because obviously I've got a bit more experience of traveling in this way. So I just had one of them came down with me. And so we went down. Now this photo was a bit blurry because to get this particular picture, we were up here and you can see from my worried look on my face, um, we were taking it in turns to hang over the edge with our cameras. And I'm actually hanging onto this chap's leg. So this is Oliver, my Swedish, um, yes, he was from Sweden. He's uh, one of the guys in the group where I was guiding and he had agreed to get up early and I'm actually leaning on his leg so that he doesn't slip off as he leans over to get these pictures and we climbed up inside one of the towers the guards had unlocked it for us and this was the very top part of the tower and we'd climbed up this vertical staircase to get up here and then squeezed out in through this hole so that we were looking out over the rooftop so we are like that and as I said, taking it in turns to take photos and create a bit of leverage and weight on the legs so that that person wouldn't topple over as they're taking their pictures. And when we came down, we found quite a few people down in the square. And I was a bit concerned they might think we were being disrespectful as foreigners, but everyone was friendly and welcoming. And they wanted to know our stories as much as we wanted to know their stories. And although we had limited communication because I spoke 
some very basic Uzbek and I could speak some Russian and don't ask me to speak my Uzbek now. I've completely forgotten it, I think. Um, so but we could communicate on a very basic level and do introductions and greetings and talk to these people. They'd actually come down from Kiva, so they were very interested to hear that we'd been to Kiva as well. And they invited us to take some photos. And there were times when I'm traveling that I think, oh, I wish I had someone from Uzbekistan traveling with me and I can ask them about the different cultural aspects, such as this lady with her gold teeth. I was fascinated by them. Unfortunately, we didn't have the words for me to find out from her exactly why she had these gold teeth. And of course, people want photos. It was felt that it was perhaps not quite right for me to be in the picture. But as you can see, slipped in amongst everyone here is this chap. So this is Oliver, the tourist who was with me. And so he sat there proudly with the rest of them who had come to have a look at the Registan and to pay their respects. And then of course, instead of paying their respects, they were far more interested in the motorbike, having a look around it, asking questions. Oliver spoke no Uzbek and very, very little Russian. So I was having to do the interpreting and finding out from the men that actually I was the first foreign woman they'd ever spoken to. They found it fascinating that I was the one who was in charge. They said in their culture, it would be very unusual for a, a woman to be in charge of a group of men. And the fact that I was leading them and that I had my own very large motorbike. For this journey, the orange motorbike that I was riding, that's a 1200cc. It's one of the biggest bikes to go traveling on, but I could show them that I could handle it with ease. They, at this point, I think these days now, there are more motorbikes like this in Uzbekistan, but in those days they said, no, there were no motorbikes of this size in the country. Mm. They talked to me as well about the police and I had been stopped by the police the previous day for speeding. And I'd said to the police, um, oh, I'm very sorry. I don't think I have been speeding. It's quite a common um, problem that foreigners encounter when they're in other countries, when you're very obviously a foreign person, is that the police will flag you down and say, you've been speeding and they will ask for some money. They'll say it's a fine, but usually it's a bribe. And I do make it a point of honor to not pay these bribes. And so I said, I'm sorry, um, I have no money on me. And the police were like, oh, well, why not? And I said, well, because my husband carries the money and I'm not actually married, but when I'm traveling, I wear a fake wedding ring. And they said, well, where's your husband? And I said, well, didn't you see him? He was ahead of me. Of course, I was following my husband like any good wife would. And I said, he's got money, so we need to catch up with him and we'll be able to catch up. He'll be waiting for me in the next town. So come with me and he'll pay my fine. And I was lucky because I called their bluff on that. I was pretty sure they wouldn't want to leave their shaded spot by the road under the trees and try and, in, and lose the fact of trying to catch more people for speeding fines or bribes. And so I absolutely insisted, no, I don't carry any money. I'm a woman. My husband has the money. And in the end, they let me go. There's been times when I've had to resort to tears as well to get away from the speeding police in other countries. And this, these are some of the moments that I really enjoy where the women come up to me. And it's quite interesting how segregated at times different cultures can be. And they were even more fascinated about the fact that I was riding the motorbike and were asking me, you know, who was I with? Where's, you know, where's my husband? Where's my family? And um, I would tell them either that I'm traveling on my own or that I'm traveling with a group of men and I'm in charge. And they'd asked to, well, they'd asked more questions about my life 
Whereas with the men, I found out that they would ask questions about the motorbike, the mechanics, the size of the engine. Whereas the women were just fascinated with what is this foreigner doing here riding a motorbike? And when I would try to explain just how far I'd ridden, I'd ridden across the world to Australia. For so many, it was beyond their imagination. And so all I needed to say was, I've ridden from Kazakhstan and I'm on my way to Tajikistan. And they would go very wide eyed and say, oh, such a long way. And I would agree with them. Yes, that is a very long way. And be unable to explain that actually I've already ridden the 5,000 miles it took me from the UK to get to Uzbekistan. So Uzbekistan, the adventurous riding going through the deserts, the beautiful buildings and the culture. But I would definitely say for me, the best of the memories are the ones where I'm talking to the locals and we're sharing our stories with each other. And those are the ones that I left your beautiful country with these warm memories of these friendships that I made and these conversations that I had. So I have so many questions about Uzbekistan, such as things like all the little girls had short hair as well as the little boys. And yet when they're older, the women all have long hair. Um, they related better to me because I had long hair. Uh, I've traveled before, as you saw, with very short hair. And in many cultures, they just couldn't grasp that a woman would have such short hair. And I was, and so in those countries, they would assume I was a man. So I headed off out of Uzbekistan and over the mountains, heading into Tajikistan, where the roads were gonna get an awful lot worse. And higher and higher mountains with snow on. I really enjoyed riding the Silk Road. I've ridden it twice now, and I've also gone back and led groups in Kyrgyzstan as a standalone tour. There's something about Central Asia that really draws me to it. And I recommend it to so many people I know to travel. It's got a lot of challenges, not least the condition of the roads at times, but also before you even get there, the visa situation, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And doing a cross, a cross continental trip like this, for me, I had to get something like seven visas in my passport and have them all in advance before I set off on my journey. Um, I know now that sort of year on year things change. Usually it gets easier to get the visas. At times countries have had arguments and so all of a sudden it will be like, nope, no British may have a visa. But I talk to people about this is the way to get the visas and create a route, get your visas, pack your motorbike, and just set off into the sunset. I'd like to say Ramat, or thank you. And thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Tiffany, that, that was fascinating. I, I, I have a question if I may uh, start. Um, your two trips, did you go at the same time of year or did you see the country in different seasons? They were at about the same time of year. Um, when I did my solo trip, um, I my main barrier on that one, I, because I wanted to go through the Caucasus. So that's Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And I was told I have to wait until the snow has melted in the mountains of Georgia which I thought was quite a poetic start to a journey is, so I had to work out how long it would take me to get to Georgia and to be there. So I set off in the middle of April and things were pretty cold up in the mountains of Georgia, I have to say. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that was about the middle of April that I set off at and I got to Tashkent six weeks later. So um, at the, oh, and yeah, beginning of June. 
right. yeah and then it was a similar time span with the other trip but that was yeah that was just purely coincidental the other trip where i was taking the big group with me and um we were heading to china the timing on that was created more by the wet season coming in so trying to avoid the snow of the mountains in Kyrgyzstan, but also aware that the wet season in China can be quite brutal on motorbikes. So yeah, it's the same time of year. I have a, can I, can I ask a quick question? Thank you for an unbelievable presentation. I think when you started off by saying that you'd never ridden the motorbike before until you had a sort of five day crash course. <laughs> and I kind of look at you and you look like a sort of normal, sane woman. And I think what an amazing, extraordinary. About cooking, you didn't talk about food. Um, did you sort of fall in love with any Uzbek cuisine? And do you still <laughs> now at home in Cornwall? I think you said you are. Do you every night cook plof or something <laughs> like that? <laughs> my question but thank you for a wonderful presentation oh thank you for your words there um yes so the cooking and the food so as i said i do a lot of wild camping however i am vegetarian ah <laughs> and Uzbek cuisine does not lend itself very well to vegetarians although i have to say it is better than mongolian food which is no. yeah. mutton based no. um <laughs> So, yes, I was eating plov and I was explaining each time I was having a meal, if I was eating out, I would explain that I don't eat meat. And the way I do that in my travels is I say to people, it's my religion. And that's why I'm unable to eat meat or fish or chicken. You know, for me, anything with a face. Um, it hasn't stopped people though in the past I remember eating one meal years ago in Pakistan and that spoke very good English and I explained you know no meat I don't eat meat and he goes oh yes madam okay okay and presented me with a dish and I thought it does look a bit meaty fried a bit and I went oh oh it's meat and he said madam that is not meat that is brains oh. Oh. oh that's okay then <laughs> well yeah exactly exactly so so I realised that I, I can be taken very literally, which is why I sort of explain, you know, that no part of an animal, that nothing with a face, you know, will mm. I eat. So I eat a lot of vegetables. Um, I always carry some lentils. Um, mm. I know I'm sure a lot of travellers, you know, I'm, you know, in my role as a guide, I'm, I do some research into, you know, what are the local specialities? And I talk to local guides about which restaurants would be the best for people to sample food that is typical of that particular region or of that particular time of year perhaps or celebratory foods for different festivals that kind of thing um, but yes I did get and also where I'm on a bit of a budget as well I did get a little bit tired of plov <laughs> and I would scrape I'd be trying to scrape bits of meat out of the plov as well um, I'm sure everyone here knows what plov is, apart from my dad and mum who are watching down there. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's, it's basically a risotto. Um, I'd say it's the Central Asian version of a risotto, and I was to find it in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan as well. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for a lovely talk. It was fascinating. Can I ask a question? Um, whether you had any accidents uh, on the way and how did you cope with it because uh, the journey you've taken they were quite risky I would say um yes on that particular journey did we have any I we didn't have any accidents in Uzbekistan and although I dropped the motorbike a bit in the desert in Kizilkum before I got to the town um I was very fortunate I was never injured um when I so in some parts of the world, like I've had an accident in Mongolia later on on that trip. Um, my boyfriend had joined me at that point and he was riding on the back of the motorbike and he managed to get himself a bit injured. So I shipped him home and carried on traveling. But um, for example, that was uh, an accident in the middle of nowhere with no other vehicles involved. And we just had to put the tent up and wait until the morning. And then I managed to find a vehicle that was head, you know, 
in Mongolia there are no roads um so there was a I could hear a vehicle and I sort of ran across the plains and managed to get a lift with the vehicle to the nearest town to get help to then come back um it is a risky thing to be doing I've also had an accident in the Namibian desert which is probably just as sparsely populated as Mongolia or as sparsely populated as the Kizilkum desert um and I sort of lived to tell the tale um again in the end there was a pass a, a, a truck passing by that sort of came to our assistance that was when I was traveling with my friend so you can never guarantee exactly what's going to happen on any trip and I've had accidents on the highway in America with a front tire blowout for example and was yeah but that could happen in this country it could happen in Uzbekistan that something like that could happen anywhere and um, it's just about how lucky you can be with what the effects are of that fall and whether you can pick yourself up pick your motorbike up if you need to go to hospital is there a hospital anywhere nearby um, to get treatment I mean I've been treated in one hospital where they had an x-ray machine that worked so they could show me some great x-rays in my neck but they didn't have any running water mm. <laughs> um, so yeah so it's yeah so I've been really lucky and I'm gonna I touch wood as I say this that I haven't had you know the accidents that I have had I've always been able to patch myself up patch the motorbike up and carry on with my travels thank you I have another question, if I may. I mean, you're traveling across countries and continents. I, I think one of the things that um, interested me and surprised me most about Uzbekistan is is the heterogeneity of, 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 of the culture. I mean, you have a, a mixture of Persian culture, of Turkic culture. Uh, in Bukhara, you have Jewish culture. I mean, it, it's, it's a very, very cosmopolitan country. Um, I just wonder, you know, when you're traveling from one country to another um, on your motorbike, obviously you're very exposed to people. You, you, you can smell things, uh, you, you can hear much more easily. Uh, do you have a sense of crossing frontiers or does it all become like a sort of, um, does, does one just merge into another or, do, or, or are there times where you think I've crossed the frontier and these people, people are different? Um, I'm just, just curious on that part of the world. Yeah, um, I have to say that part of the world in particular, it really stands out. Um, I know generally most of Central Asia has quite a lot of words in common language wise, um, but crossing the borders, we would find very different people and um, just, yeah, each country felt very different. It's... Yeah, it's, I suppose it could be difficult to explain, um, but quite often the people will look different, the uh, architecture will look a bit different. And I really was very interested that as an outsider for my first time in Central Asia, I had a very distinct sense of just how different each of the stands were. And, um, you know, but obviously being aware that some of the countries are create, have been created in quite, uh, quite, quite a strange way, sort of, right, let's put this as Kyrgyzstan, let's put this as Uzbekistan. Um, so, yeah, so I, there is very much a sense of the different countries that I'm coming into. I would love to carry more guidebooks, for example, and have more information about each of the countries, but on a motorbike, obviously, there's not a lot of space for guidebooks and that kind of thing. I mean, I do always carry a Lonely Planet guide. The one I carried on that trip was the Central Asia book, and then once I got through Central Asia, I gave that to some people I was staying with in Russia um, because that was the route I took going on to Mongolia. And um, so I'll use my guidebook to try and get as much information as possible, but also find local people who um, whose English is better than my local language and sort of pump them for information about going on why why do these people dress like this perhaps or what are the traditions behind some of the actions that I'm seeing around me all right interesting uh, uh, we so, have a question for that's come up hasn't it 
Yeah, from Vesna. Right. Can you see that, Tiffany? I yeah, can... yeah, I can see it. So which part of the trip did I regard as the most dangerous and why? Um, I would have to say it was crossing, for me, it was crossing the desert. Um, I think for most people, when they hear about my journeys and what I'm doing, they say, weren't you concerned about your safety and the dangerous people in the world? And I said, well, actually 99.9% .9 of the people I meet are lovely people. They're kind people, they're generous people who invite me into houses and feed me and give me water to drink. Um, so it's not the people. For me, it is those remote areas such as the desert. Um, I'm very wary with deserts. The, my first crossing of the Sahara, I wasn't carrying enough water and I didn't actually have enough carrying capacity, enough bottles uh, for the uncertainty from one settlement to another. Would I make it there in a day? Am I carrying enough water? So that made me almost paranoid about crossing deserts. Well, I suppose with good reason. Um, so for me, it was crossing the desert and that was sort of such a big plus that Leon was there with his van to carry the fuel and also carry all these litres of extra water I wanted him to carry on my behalf as well. I would have tackled it on my own because I had no other choice. That was the only route for me to get through. And obviously I had to arrive in Tashkent to go and meet Anne. So yes, so the desert and having had some um, you know, an accident in the Namibian desert some years before that, I was sort of very aware just how remote and how risky it can be and to not be taking chances with my riding so that, you know, I can get somewhere in one piece with the motorbike still running. Yes. May I ask a question? Um, wh where's your next journey going to be? Are you planning another long distance trip? Oh my goodness, yes, yes, well, <laughs> do you know what, at this moment I'm supposed to be um, in Tierra del Fuego, the southern tip of South America. Um, I was asked to lead a tour group this year. Um, we were going to set off in September from the Caribbean coastline of Colombia, and I was going to take them the whole length of South America down to Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost tip of the world. Um, so... Yes, I should be there now and it's um, their summer. Um, so yes, that trip's been, so that's one where I'm leading a group. So that's been put back until next year. So fingers crossed that's gonna happen. For myself, the journey that I would like to do next um, is what I call joining up the dots and the map of the world that I showed early on with all these different journeys I'd done on my motorbike and I'd been, oh, in fact, I don't know if you can see on this map here behind me. So there we are. So Africa, I'd gone from Cape Town all the way up the East Coast and home. And I've also been from Europe down into Northwest Africa. But what I'd like to do is what I call joining up the dots of taking this West Coast road down through Africa Except the road doesn't follow the coast completely. I have to go inland through Congo as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd love to ride to Cape Town taking the west side of Africa. Uh, I'm not sure when that will happen yet. Um, I've got a couple more tours now. that I've, The tours that I'm supposed to have been leading are sort of backing up. So at the moment, um, I'm due back in um, Asia the year after next. I've got a three-month trip taking a group to Bangkok. Unfortunately, not via Central Asia, we're taking the Russian Mongolian China route. Um, but somewhere, yeah, somewhere in the next few years, I'm going to fit in the joining up the dots in Africa. But are you not afraid of being kidnapped? Because those bits of Africa are a little bit dangerous, I think, aren't they? Um, do you know what? There's, there's a lot of places in the world that get considered dangerous. And then I get there and I find out, oh, actually everyone here is just really nice. And they're all saying, wait a minute, you've come from that country. Oh, wasn't that very dangerous? And I say, no. And they say, oh, but you're going into this next country and that's a very dangerous one. And I'll go there a little bit tentatively. And I get there and they say, oh, you've just come from that country. That's the dangerous place. So there's a lot of fear about other countries. Mm. And the media has a lot to answer for because it's these sensational stories of people 
perhaps getting kidnapped. Um, Northwest Africa is tricky, but the beauty of traveling on my own, um, and they've tarmacked the Sahara now. I mean, I've crossed the Sahara three times and they have now tarmacked it. So that's a lot easier. Um, I'm sort of looking forward to crossing it on tarmac and not having to tackle the sand. But there is also a bit of sadness that at part of, you know, what is an incredible journey is no longer with us because it's no longer sand. Mm. So, yeah, so to travel across there. Um, and yeah, there's some concerns with Northwest Africa because of um, Al Qaeda and stuff where they have been kidnapping some motor well, tourists and specifically some motorcyclists. I've, I've got a friend who is still traveling through. Every year, there are still hundreds of people traveling through and getting through safely. Yeah. Due to the media, we hear about those who don't get safely. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a gamble. And I always, you know, I, my story for the Al Qaeda ones are, you do realize I'm British and you do realize the British government do not pay ransoms. They absolutely will not pay ransom. So what you need to do is kidnap an Italian or a French or an American because their governments will pay the ransoms. And they all know the Brits won't. So I just sort of figure that might keep me safe. Thank you. You're welcome. I, ha I have a question um, relating, going back to your trip across the desert. I was just wondering with the modern technology have you got a satellite phone or a phone that, that, that tells people exactly where you are and they can see if you're moving or not? No, so I don't have a GPS, partly because I'm too stingy to buy one, but also um, some early experiences of coming, of traveling. Sometimes I'll meet up with other travelers and we might travel together for a while. And some of them with their GPSs, um, they were getting quite lost and so that picture where I was using the GPS in Bukhara, when I work for tour companies, they insist I take a GPS. So I'll take one because they've paid for it and they sort of <laughs> show me how to use it. Um, but for myself, I use a map, a compass. I have a good sense of direction as far as finding places. I don't carry a satellite phone because they are horrendously expensive and very desirable by other people. And they would make me a target if some, you know, someone would think, oh my goodness, look what she's got. We want to steal that. So there is that. Um, I've never, because I started traveling before the internet and before mobile phones, I've never got into using the mobile phone for stuff. Um, and I don't travel with one because, I mean, these days, I mean, I carry, I have carried my laptop with me and I sort of keep my blog up to date. And I did have something called a spot tracker that people could see where I was. Um, and the one time someone got concerned that I hadn't moved and I was actually, I was in New Mexico in the USA and I was actually trying to get, I was going heading to a friend's house, um, someone I'd met on the road in Colombia. And I was, he lives in New Mexico and I was heading to his house and he'd been anticipating my arrival and he was tracking me on the spot tracker, which, and, um, it apparently the spot track when I arrived at his house that that evening, he said, oh, what happened to you? I called out the highway patrol. Your spot tracker stopped moving. And they were very concerned and they went out and searched that stretch of road. And yet here you are. Um, so, yeah, it didn't it showed that I had was no longer moving and he was very concerned. I'd had an accident and was lying in the ditch somewhere. And so alerted highway patrol, who very kindly went to search for me, whereas I I just we don't know why it showed that. Um, the reason I had the spot tracker was just for interest for people. It wasn't for an emergency. And I had one on the trip when I had the group with me. And I, when we headed on through into Tibet, I can remember at one point, my spot tracker had got lost. And I'd very quickly realized, oh my goodness, it's not on the bike anymore. It's gone, I need to get it back. I couldn't turn back to get it because I had, I was the tail end Charlie that day and it was essential I stayed with my group. Some of them were having some real problems riding at the high altitude roads and up the high mountain passes in Tibet. And I needed to be there to help them pick up their motorbike. So I couldn't go back to get it. And it turns out somebody had found it, one of the village boys, and he was pressing the emergency call button. 
And so my mum got a phone call at 4 a.m. Hello, this is International Rescue at Spot Tracker. Uh, we're calling to let you know your daughter um, is in distress somewhere in the Tibetan mountains. We've alerted the embassy. We are, it's all done in an American accent at four in the morning, if you can imagine that. And my mum just said, uh, so she picked up the phone at four in the morning. She goes, oh, well, Tiffany's, oh, she's working for a tour company now. Here's their phone number. I'm sure you'll be able to track her down through that. Hi. And hung up. <laughs> um, for, for a lot of my friends, that's their favourite story about my travels, is the fact that my mum was so blasé when she was told I was in distress, my emergency beacon had gone off, and actually all I'd done was lost the bloody thing. And it was like... Um, so I now have, um, a, I, I sometimes still carry it, but I have a fake phone number that they will contact so that they don't get through and wake up my mum in the early hours because it's like, what, what's the point in telling someone who can do nothing about it that I've got a problem? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's very much personal choice. I'd say I probably, it is one of the questions I do get asked by people, oh, you must carry a phone. And I say, well, no, because... What's going to be the point of phoning anyone? I've, I've got to get out of this myself. Um, I'm going to have to rely on the people around me and my own resourcefulness or lack of it. Um, okay. Does that answer that for you? It did. <laughs> so, so we have another question in the chat from Geraldine. Where and how did you learn your mechanical skills? Right, okay, so I learned them when Becky and I first bought the motorbike and we took the bike to a friend who is a mechanic. He said, you two need to come along to my workshop. Now I've never owned any other vehicle. And in fact, I've still got the motorbike now. I ride it every day for work. Um, and I've never owned a car, although I can drive cars. And anyway, so he said, you need to learn the basics before you travel. And we were in complete agreement. So we had two days in the mechanic's workshop with him and he showed us how to do a very intensive maintenance program. And we can do, so all the usual things like checking the oils, changing the oils. On that particular BMW, there's three different types of oil because there's engine oil, gearbox oil, and final drive oil that all needs changing. And I can um, do my valve timings, the tappets. I can take the engine cover off. I can check the tappets and, and adjust those. We can take the wheels off, we can change tires. There's quite a lot that I did learn that's all sort of on quite a basic level. And some of it I well, I obviously put into practice. I do all my own maintenance whilst we're on the road because there's a very few and far between BMW dealerships with um, engineers. And so we do all that ourselves. And then quite often I am just relying on local mechanics that I'll push the motorbike when it's broken down, I can put it on the back of the truck. I've been towed behind other motorbikes, towed behind pickup trucks, um, or I'll just push the bike until I find a village with a mechanic. And because it's an older motorbike, it is easier to work on. So I've sort of had mechanics have a look at it and say, ah, oh, pistons, carburettors. Ah, oh, it's like a car. And I'm like, yep, it's like a car. And they're like, bang, bang, bang because they've never seen a big motorbike before. You know, the, a lot of these countries are so remote, they don't have big motorbikes. Now, bang, 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 here's the broken part. And here in the UK, we would replace the part. You know, you're ordering a new part but in so many countries. And as I'm sure you're all aware with Uzbekistan, someone local would say, oh, do you know what? I've got a machine shop. I can make another part like that and put it in. Or we can repair that broken part. Or do you know what? we've got something like that that's used in the local Toyotas. Let me go to the market and I'll go to the market, find a very similar part, put it on my motorbike, and then I carry on my journeys. And so I've managed to travel with parts out of a Toyota, a Mazda, some Russian car that I can't even pronounce. They've slotted the parts in, the bike has worked. And even if it's only gonna work for a couple of months, usually it means I can get to somewhere um, where I can get a part sent out. So I've had parts sent out to me in outer Mongolia, um, down in the middle of Africa as well, I've had parts sent. Um, so yeah, so I, I have been, again, touching wood, I've been quite lucky with mechanical issues. I've always managed to either sort it myself or find a mechanic who's been able to do it. 
we have a question from Rosa um, about how your trips require strength and stamina. So how, how do you keep in shape? How, what type of regime do you follow to ensure that you're ready for all the challenges you meet? Okay, oh, that's a really good one, Rosa. Um, quite a lot of people I know when they go on long-term trips say, oh my goodness, my fitness levels go down and this happens, goes, you know, you know my weight gets more. I'm, and I find it's the opposite with me. I always lose some weight when I'm traveling because I'm quite often eating an unfamiliar diet, but also it's, it is very physical riding that big motorbike. You know, like I said, it weighs quarter of a ton. Um, the, even just riding it on a road, um, if it's decent tarmac and I'm able to do 50, 60 miles an hour, that is the, you know, there is that physical force of 60 miles an hour blow, trying to blow me off the motorbike and I'm using handlebars and gripping onto them, keeping the balance of the motorbike and also, and I've got someone on the back, that extra balance that's needed. So I find it's a workout in itself, just riding the motorbike. And as the days, weeks and months go by, um, I will, you know, my strength builds up and I actually can see in photos from some of my trips sort of, you know, where I do become more muscular as the trip goes on. And um, I, when I've dropped my motorbike, there is there's some weird technique you can do with BMWs, but I think also what worked for me is sheer panic. So the adrenaline is rushing of, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of nowhere. My motorbike's fallen over. I've got to pick it up, <gasps> grab it, pick it up. And so again touch wood I've always been able to pick up my bike wherever I've dropped it um there's been a couple of close calls uh the salt flats in Utah the Bonneville salt flats I was camped out there in the middle of nowhere and I wasn't on my motorbike it's parked up on the side stand down I was putting my tent up and the motorbike toppled over and um it's because it was still slightly the wet season and it was a bit clay like the surface and the side stand just sunk into the clay and the whole bike went over and because it was sunk into the clay it was difficult to pick it up and I actually ended up having to take all the bags off emptying the top box at the back taking the fuel tank off because I had a full tank of fuel which is 22 litres so that's getting on yes yeah, so that's about 22 kil uh, kilograms so removing my fuel tank which is quite straightforward on my old-fashioned motorbike so taking all that off and then gradually just heaving the bike up. And each time I sort of heaved it up a little bit, I would shove one of the pannier cases under it with my foot as I'm lifting up the bike each time. So I build up some strength through lifting up my motorbike, through general riding and just having a very outdoors life as well while I'm on the bike. Thank you. I have one more question for me. I remember being in India and I saw that everyone was riding Royal Enfields, um, old English motorbikes, I guess, made in Enfield. Uh, do you see in different regions of the world uh, a, a sort of a favourite bike people have? Um, do you identify, you know, a region with a bike? Oh, absolutely. And like you say, in India, it is the Royal Enfield. They, they are all manufactured in India now. Um, they they started using Royal Enfields at the when India gained independence, so back in the late forties, and they loved the motorbike so much that they increasingly bought more and more each year. And then in the end, they said, "Look, we can we buy a factory from you?" They said to Enfield, so Royal Enfield said, "Okay, you can buy one of our factories." So they bought a factory, set it up um, down in Bangalore, I think it is, and they you know, and now. The British, I mean, the British um, version of Enfields uh, closed down, I think, in the 60s or early 70s. But they're still made, um, they make millions of them in India. And in fact, it's enjoyed quite a resurgence because they have dealerships all over the world now. I've ridden Royal Enfields in South America, where they've got all the latest dealerships there, um, obviously throughout Asia and in parts of Africa. So they've yeah, so they have the Royal Enfield, um, Russia, Siberia in particular, the Urals, um, which are based on the old BMW models from the Second World War. Um, but most places, it's more the smaller, lightweight bikes, the ones that can handle difficult roads. And increasingly these days, it's Chinese bikes. It's the what we regard as very cheap 
Chinese bikes that are becoming increasingly common. Um, they're not always the most reliable. Um, oh, and also the Harley Davidsons in America. So yes, I've been, you know, had American bikers say, well, hey, why aren't you riding a Harley? <laughs> and, uh, yes, they, they, are, uh, they are not comfortable to ride is always my response. It's uh, that very laid back. And whereas my bike is quite upright, um, almost like a Mary Poppins style bicycle that it's very upright and I'm like that. And it's that, that's actually a very comfortable position to ride a motorbike with. Right. We, we have another question from Rosa about uh, camping in the middle of nowhere. Um, are you scared of the, the animals, the people, the weather um, when you're camping? Um, yeah, that's a really good question because I think that's particularly why I put in that picture of um, myself and Anne camping. When Becky and I first set off, we were a bit worried about doing the wild camping. Um, I It's something I'd done a fair bit of. I've done a lot of trekking and hiking in my time. So I've done solo hiking where I'm carrying everything myself and <laughs> setting off for days at a time with my just with my tent and my food, crossing mountains. I've done that in New Zealand, in parts of Africa and um, in Bolivia in particular. So I'm used to sort of that wild camping thing, but it felt very different with the motorbike because actually initially our main worry was the motorbike would be stolen. So crossing Europe where, you know, and in those days the bike was still shiny and sort of new looking. Um, we were concerned, oh my goodness, the motorbike will get stolen. So that was always our worry. We weren't worried so much about our personal safety. Uh, perhaps we should have been, I don't know. So um, we would, yeah, so we didn't sleep very well at first. And then after about a week or so of, of sort of waking up at every noise in the night, we realized, you know what? We're gonna be on this journey for quite a long time. If we are unable to sleep very well, we are not gonna have a good time at all. So let's forget about worrying, let's just sleep. And so sort of having learned that lesson early on, and it's something I pass on to others who are traveling and wild camping for the first time. I say, you will sleep badly at first, and then you realize actually there is nothing happening. Um, I've, yeah, I've always been very lucky. I think my main fear with the wild animals, um, so in Africa, did I show that picture with the tribesmen? We'd been wild camping and we were talking to someone the next day and he was a local tribesman with a spear and um, I can speak some basic Swahili. So I was talking to him about his spear and he said, well, I'm carrying the spear because of the Simba and Simba means lion in Swahili. And we said, what, there's lions around here? And he said, well, yeah, you know, that's why we carry spears. And uh, we said, mm, we haven't got any weapons. Mm. So after that, what we did was um, we were still camping at night because there's no accommodation in parts of Africa, but we would make sure we would get to a village compound and we'd go to the village compound and we'd talk to the village elder, which generally was a man. So talk to the head man and just sort of explain, oh, look, we're traveling with the motorbike. We've got a tent. We need to put it up. Can we put it inside the compound? And they were always so hospitable and would be offering mud huts and all sorts. And so we might take a mud hut but to be honest, we put the tent up inside the mud hut because the tent is mosquito proof and the hut isn't. And so I'd say that was, we were more worried about catching malaria than uh, being attacked by big animals. And the only other place in the world really is the bears. I mean, my, my worry about, um, you know, it's the bears in the very north of the States, um, Alaska, Canada, um, wild camping going up through there and just being, trying to be very bear aware. Um, I'd, I'd say that was probably more, we were more at risk of those than of the big, the big animals in Africa. Amazing. <laughs> I wouldn't dare do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Neither would I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what drives you to go into all these adventures? Um, Oh, I think my mum and dad have gone now. I think it's my parents you'd have to ask. For me, it's a curiosity about the world, about the people, the places, and just thinking, you know, I want to, I want to go there. I want to see it. Um, so, for example, the Timbuktu trip, I was, 
I think I just crossed every continent and there never was a plan to cross every continent. It was just each time I got somewhere, I think, oh, I wouldn't mind going to see there and then go there. Oh, let's see here. But coming back from a trip where I'd ridden from the top of Alaska to the bottom of South America and I thought, crikey, Tiffany, you've crossed every continent now. Do you go, you know, what happens now? And a, a memory came back to me of when I was 12 years old and looking in an atlas of the world. And I've always had a fascination for maps. And I remember looking in his atlas and finding Timbuktu on the page there. And I thought, oh, Timbuktu, it's a real place. It's not just a name made up by grown ups to mean somewhere far away. You know, that literally was what I thought. And I can remember when I was 12 thinking, right, one day I'm going to go to Timbuktu. I'm going to see the palm trees and the camels and the sand. And I want to go there. And then 20 odd years later, when I was on that plane coming back from South America, I thought, oh, I've crossed every continent. Oh, but I haven't been to Timbuktu. So <laughs> that became the next journey for me. I mean, I, I mean, I, I work as a youth and community worker when I'm here in the UK. So I just sort of work hard, save up my money. I live very frugally. My priority is my travels. I've always lived in shared houses. So the bills and everything are shared um, because I save every penny to go traveling because that's, oh, I don't it's my passion. It's, yeah, it just is what I do, I suppose. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much, Tiffany. It's, it's, it's been really fascinating listening to you. Absolutely. And very I, motivating. Yeah, and I, I hope you're able to get out on your bike uh, sooner than later. I mean, I guess we all hope that sooner than later we'll be able to yeah. uh, start traveling again. But I, it really has been yeah, inspiring listening to you. And thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, we normally have um, events um, physically obviously um in the embassy in london hopefully they will start again next year i, I spent tuesday morning with the ambassador in the embassy uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're hoping that maybe by late spring it will be possible to, to to meet again so we will definitely invite you to to, to come up and um see see one of our events taste plov uh, you can take the meat out it won't cause any <laughs> uh, but yes well, i think we're all looking forward to um a uh, uh, british Ushbek society event where we could all all meet up although it's been yeah very interesting listening to you and it has the other speakers over the course of the year uh, so thank you very much indeed yeah yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, thank, thank you, everyone. You've been, yeah, you've yeah, asked some really, really interesting questions. Sometimes there's just a silence at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fascination. Yeah. Uh, I think we're all going to go and look at our maps now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, work out your own journey to get exactly. there. It doesn't need to be 5,000 miles. I seem to have taken a slightly longer route. <laughs> Maybe we'll all go and service our motorcycles now. Yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you then, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Bye, -bye. everybody. Thank nice you. Good evening. Thanks. Yeah.